last week was about essays. This week is also going to be about college essays, different types of college essays, and perhaps the main types of college essays that every student will be filling out sooner or later. All right, we got that number going up and up. Great, well, my name is Jonathan Ginsberg, uh, president of BC Education, and very excited to cover this topic with you. Uh, college essays are one of the biggest pain points in the college application process. They're different from traditional in-school writing. They're kind of a unique type of writing that most students don't have any experience in. You have to write about yourself. Who are you? What do you want to do? Uh, this has nothing to do with the typical analytical style taught in schools, and it can be a little intimidating. And so it's, we're going we're to spend a lot of time on this topic and appreciate everybody uh, taking the time to listen in, and hopefully it's, uh, it's useful for all of you. All right, great. Well, let's just hop right into it. And <clears throat> before uh, talking about the essay specifically, just want to, of course, uh, let everybody know who is BEC and a little bit about BEC education. Uh, although you could say we do the typical college consulting, tutoring, test prep, uh, these things are associated with traditional education consulting. But we also like to emphasize our education philosophy uh, the idea that college is simply a tool, simply a stage in your life for your future, and it's our goal to help you plan for that future. So what kind of person are you trying to become? What kind of problems are you trying to solve? And therefore, what sort of career path suits you? And if we keep that as our goal, uh, then suddenly the plan we provide for students can be a lot more meaningful. It can be more impactful and more beneficial for college as you become the kind of students that colleges want. So in addition uh, to our yearly mentor consulting service, which we have for middle school students, high school students, college students, and besides our application consulting service for those applying to high school, those applying to undergraduate, those applying to graduate schools, uh, it's also very, very important that we provide opportunities for students. So if we're career oriented, we need to let students have hands-on experience doing the thing that may be their future career. So whether that means tapping into our network of partner companies, for internships or professors for research. We are proud to provide real world projects and opportunities for our students uh, to learn and uh, ways they can apply their skills. Of course, if you wanna learn more, please contact us, email us, call us, add us on WeChat. If you're already in the group, great. If you're not in the group, you can join the group. And we have, of course, our Facebook account. We have a YouTube channel if you wanna see past videos. Uh, so lots of ways to get in touch if you do want to. Uh, speak to an education consultant here at BEC. All right, and of course, it's a special year, so uh, it would be a little bit remiss not to say why this year is special and just talk about essays. Last, last week, we did talk about UCs, but in general, uh, what's been the trend or new news as it pertains to university admissions uh, in the age of COVID-19? That seems to be the phrase everybody's using, in the age of COVID-19. Well, what's changed? Uh, one is a lot of schools have gone test optional. We're going to have a slide next, which illustrates whether you should take that seriously or not. Uh, but schools are test optional, meaning you don't need to submit an SAT or ACT, uh, unlike years past where you did need to. And also there is this concern about, is it going to get harder or easier? There's theories on both sides. Oh, is it gonna, this year going to be harder or easier because of COVID? Now, uh, overall, we're going to put out the data and you can make your assessment, but essentially there's going to be a big drop. There is a certain drop expected in domestic enrollment in colleges, but especially strong in international students. International students represent 5.5% of all students in U.S. colleges. That is a much higher percentage at top colleges, more like 10%. Uh, it's not that top colleges have fewer, they actually have more international students. So America has 2,000 institutions of higher education. So 5.5 is actually on the low side if you're looking at the top 100, top 50 uh, institutions, which are, you know, all of our students are, are looking at. Uh, but I'll give you one example. University of Arizona is predicting a worst case drop, 80% in new international applicants. I think that's a little high. That's a worst case scenario that they actually wrote out. So that's a huge difference. They expect 30% of existing international students to maybe not come back. Big revenue losses for them. Uh, if you look at the trend more broadly, the consensus seems to be around 25% drop expected. So if that's a school with 10% of their students are international, you're dropping 
you know, we're looking at two and a half percent total, right? I think my, I think my math is correct here, but that's very significant. Two and a half percent is huge. Uh, now, then you look at what people are saying, well, what about the gap year students, the students that don't want to attend this year because of COVID, but will attend next year. So they should be filling up spots for next year. And that's true, but we've spoken to some different enrollment uh, officers, and they're seeing this at really about one to 2% of incoming freshmen. So it's not uh, so significant. The majority of students are still just going to attend university as originally planned. Um, so these numbers in some ways almost canceled themselves out with a two and a half percent drop in uh, applications with the, uh, the extra 2% students waiting. But in the end, uh, we believe that certain universities are just gonna stay hard to the extent they could change very little. Harvard's gonna stay hard. You know, it's really difficult to get into Harvard, right? That's fine. Uh, but are there schools that are going to possibly need to maintain enrollment and may take more students? Uh, and especially if you're not applying for financial aid, yes. If you're a strong, even a strong liberal arts college like Bates, I don't mean to pick on Bates, but it will probably be a little bit easier. Uh, so you have to be aware of the school's financial situation and that can actually impact a little bit more into their decision-making process than normal. There are the need blind schools, very few. Uh, in reality, of course, uh, it goes generally in, as part of the discussion of, you know, what does this student cost us? Uh, so we do foresee that especially uh, smaller liberal arts colleges uh, are going to perhaps be a little bit easier than in the past. Of course, this also means uh, with all the changes happening at school, the essays will matter more than ever. So maybe you're not submitting tests. So how do they judge how good you are? Uh, potentially, you have limited extracurricular involvement, as in maybe you couldn't do typical clubs, etc. So then how do you show you know, uh, more about yourself through the, through the grade, through the essays. And lastly, you're gonna just have a limited transcript. It's very possible that last semester you didn't get grades. A lot of our students didn't get grades last semester, it's just pass, no pass. So this underscores the importance of the essays. Okay, I see a good question. Uh, Melody, sorry, I don't know if you want me to say your name, but it says subject tests, are they going to matter as much? And do you think they'll be canceled as well because of COVID? Now, those are in an area where if you cannot do them, we would say, don't worry too much. Subject tests were getting phased out. There were almost no schools that had still required subject tests. In fact, some schools had actively said, do not uh, send them in. But there are certain, even at the UCs, if you go into certain majors at certain schools, they still recommend you to do subject tests. So it's not to say that subjects matter or not. If you have the access to do it, and you can do well, they definitely matter. It's just that if you do not have the access, then it's okay if you don't submit it. I'm gonna show a policy on the next slide, which maybe illustrates that point. Of course, if anyone else has questions, please please ask them into the chat, into the Q&A. Uh, the questions are always great, so appreciate it. So this is Cornell's policy. This is the first year Cornell's ever gone test optional. And we're gonna look very at the highlighted parts where they say Cornell overall has not planned to adopt a test optional admissions policy permanently. So this is a one-time thing, or anyway, they're not so happy about it. It's just temporary. And if you cannot do it, it's okay. If you cannot take the test, it's impossible for you to take SAT, ACT, it's okay. But in Cornell's review during the 2020 to 2021 application cycle, results from the ACT or SAT might still be a meaningful differentiator in particular for students who live near or attend a school that will be open, where testing will be offered, or live near a testing center that will be offering more testing seats or dates than they did in 2019. So basically, as long as you're near a center that still has it, and have not experienced lost income from one or more of their household providers, or other significant hardships and losses during 2020. So do you have the access to a test center? I Meaning, could you do it? And as long as you have a reasonable financial situation to take the test. They would really prefer you do it. They say it could be a meaningful differentiator. They don't write those words lightly. So uh, through the attitude of the policy, you start to quickly uh, parse out what does optional mean? It means, well, optional if you literally cannot take it. I'm in a very poor neighborhood. There are no test centers around me and I can't get there. You know, one of my parents, I only have one parent and they're working three jobs. Okay, well, you don't need to take it. 
But assuming you're not in that situation, it's really highly advised. It could be a meaningful differentiator. So we just want to take the test optional a policy with a grain of salt because we can see directly from the writing uh, what they truly mean. All right, let's keep let's keep it moving. So some tips: what you can do uh, is we say students really need to be proactive or working with a lot of students. And the idea being that your guidance counselor is going to still submit information about you. You know, connect with that counselor, even if you can't go to school, somehow connect with them, make sure to stay current, show interest that you care about this college admissions process. You got to lock down your recommenders. If you didn't do it already, if you're a rising senior, you didn't do it already, you got to do it fast. A lot of the best teachers uh, get picked early on. We always recommend at the end of junior year to just uh, put in that request. Uh, and the thing is, a lot of the schools are just not going to be able to follow up with students as well as normally because because there's a lot of hybrid learning or all online learning so students need to be proactive we say make the test your friend we said if they if you can do well if you uh have access to a test and then take it you know make it work for you it's a key way to show your academic strength and consider your resources your extracurriculars view any extracurricular that you had previously done in person view it as a great problem to solve can it go online is there a new way to pursue this thing? We've had students who originally uh, had been doing volunteer work at elderly homes uh, and they would maybe perform for them or talk with the elderly people. And they said, oh, well, you know, it's canceled. So I can't, I can't go there anymore or it's too dangerous to go, right? I can't go. And he said, well, could this activity not be done through a Zoom uh, call? Could it not be done through virtual means? Problems equal opportunities for solutions. And that's what the college is going to want to know. That under difficult times, how did you respond? Did you say, oh, I can't do it. Sorry, you know, I just gave up. Or maybe there were other alternatives. And that can be very valuable for school, for you yourself as a student to have a meaningful experience and not just be bored all day. But two, the college get to understand who you really are. Uh, in the event that you have to think for yourself, what, what, was your, what was your conclusion? That you just had to quit? or that you had some kind of alternative solution. And then of course, uh, focus a lot of attention on your essays because they are going to speak to uh, who you are and, uh, and that is gonna be a huge differentiating factor uh, in admissions. It always is this, this year perhaps uh, even more so than normal. All right, so we're gonna go over college essay types. Uh, when I say college essay types, uh, this means you're going to be writing different essays for different purposes when you apply to different schools. So uh, the main one is the common application personal statement. Uh, it's used by all schools, except the UCs have their own system that we talked about last week, the eight, eight topics, you, you choose four of them. And then a couple of schools are still resistant to common app as in they use, their, uh, they use the coalition application. A uh, coalition is one we won't get into too much because almost all schools on coalition are also on Common App. So it makes no sense to have both unless you are applying to these schools that only use coalition. The coalition exclusive schools are University of Washington, which sadly is a very popular school, not because University of Washington is bad, it's a great school, but just because it requires a totally uh, separate application to, to submit. And Virginia Tech also is coalition exclusive. Uh, so the coalition, they have a very similar application essay to Common App. A word length is a little bit different, but we're going to focus on Common App, uh, which is one essay. You have six prompts. Well, there's a seventh prompt where you can write anything, but six prompts with a 650 word limit. The prompts really range. We're going to go through them, but they range from tell us about your background to tell us about an accomplishment that sparked a period of personal growth. Basically anything that you find valuable could go into a common app prompt, it's very broad. It's a way of getting to know you. And we're gonna talk about perhaps how you should approach schools getting to know you. And besides your common app essay, you, there's also gonna be school specific essays. We call these supplements. So every single school, almost every single school uh, has supplements and they fall into very consistent patterns. There is generally the why our school or major, you know, why do you wanna come here, right? And we're gonna go through examples. Uh, or another very typical one is how have you impacted your community or solved the problem? Uh, show us that you're a model citizen, right? Uh, and then now the other one is a favorite activity or academic interest. Basically expand upon one of your activities in your activity section in the Common App 
activity section in Common Apps, only 150 characters. So maybe they want to learn more about one of those activities. Uh, and then, of course, you have uh, some schools do these short answers. They're kind of fun. You know, tell us what you've been reading recently. Describe yourself in three words. We can't really call them essays, but they are a supplemental part of the application. Uh, and then just be aware that college essays, well, what are they? They're really opportunities to be remembered. Admission, admissions officers are people, students are people, it's people choosing people. If you read, I, I always challenge anyone to read 20 applications in a row, just 20, and try to remember who was who. And you're gonna come down to very key parts of essays that really stand out. And uh, that's, that's the basis for a lot of the decision-making. But I would say you shouldn't believe us, you really should believe what the colleges themselves are saying. So although we're speaking not about the UCs per se, uh, what the UCs are looking for is uh, indicative, it's uh, emblematic of what is being looked at broadly by other universities. So we have, you know, we had Tim Ravey uh, interviewed him uh, a while back, it's on a YouTube channel, but he's a good friend of BECs. And you know, we asked him before, what are colleges looking for? So once again, we come back to three main quality smart. Okay, that's 80% of applicants. Your GPA is good, your test scores are good. Passionate, are you doing the things that you say you like? Are you active? Okay, and that's proven through your extracurriculars and you have your essays, and that's about 40% of the students. And then if you're so smart and you're so passionate, are you planning, are you able to help the world? Is that your mission? Are you gonna make the world a better place? Or are you going to potentially harm the world? Basically, are you nice? Uh, what kind of impact are you gonna make to our campus? And realistically, once again, people choosing people, you want someone who's gonna make your campus a better place. Someone who you see, oh wow, I would love to have a coffee with this person. Oh, this person's gonna light up the room. They're gonna start clubs. They're gonna be active. They're gonna be you know, productive in discussions. So this personal quality of being nice, being likable is oftentimes never discussed in academic performance or high school aptitude. And there's no metric for it. And it can be very, very easily forgotten in the college essay process, which is meant to be a very human process, but oftentimes becomes a regurgitation of activities and performance and achievement, which is very far from what it should be. Otherwise, they already know your achievement and performance from everything else. Otherwise, they wouldn't ask the questions. They wouldn't make you, they don't want to put you through more things to do. It's not for their benefit to have to read more materials from you. Uh, so you got to think about what are, what are they really trying to achieve. Um, Let's keep going. So I'm gonna start with one student and show one example of a common app essay. We have others too, but the, it encompasses the idea that as you're approaching your applications, you have to think of who am I presenting? I'm a very complex person. I go many different directions, but I don't have 10 essays to work with. I only have a set number of input. And who do I want, what do I want to output? output to be. If somebody takes in all the input, they kind of have the different pieces of the puzzle, then what kind of picture have I created? So we're going to go through a student where our theme for the student, we thought these were uh, important qualities we wanted to share, was creative and compassionate. This person, uh, if we have any uh, people watching in Berkeley, they may know this person. Uh, I don't know. Alice Waters, she's kind of famous in the organic food movement, uh, has, a big, uh, has a big restaurant, Chez Panisse. Uh, the idea is she uh, was someone who was very creative with her cooking, and but also very compassionate. Once again, really uh, brought the organic movement for food to the forefront and connected it to fine dining, and, uh, and so has that compassion and, and caring about the environment and the health of others. So we thought, okay, this is a nice image, and how can we kind of create this image uh, for our student? So, and right before we jump in. I always think this is important. We said it last week, but a lot of new people uh, on today. Just a good quote by Maya Angelou. Uh, I've learned that people will forget what you did. So I've said, uh, people forget what you said. People forget what you did, but people will never forget how you made them feel. So the essays are all about the feeling. And we're going to get into that. So which common app prompt should this student choose? Uh, there's many, right? You could think about this all day. Wow, do I choose this one, that one? Reflect on time you question a challenge or a belief. Describe a problem you solved. Discuss an accomplishment that sparked a period of personal growth. Uh, you'll quickly realize anything can be discussed. So from our perspective, don't take too much time to read them. Reverse engineer it. If anything can work, what do you want to show? Consider your strategy. 
and then choose your prompt accordingly after writing. This is not advisable for anything but the Common App. Normally, the prompt matters a lot. You must read every word of the prompt and make sure you answer it. Otherwise, you're doing it wrong. In this case, we believe the prompts are so broad, it doesn't help you to kind of box yourself into a certain prompt. It's better to write the best story you can that you believe uh, presents the qualities that you're looking to share with the admissions officer, and then it will naturally fall into a prompt. Okay, so we're gonna run through this essay. You can read along with me. I'm gonna read it aloud. I will always remember the day I turned on the television to a captivating episode of Top Chef Masters. The contestants had to prepare a gourmet meal using only appliances found in a typical college dorm room. As I watched a five-star French chef clumsily drain noodles in the shower stall, I wished I could offer him advice. So we already have the setup here. There, the student seems to be interested in cooking and they're doing something difficult. They're operating in a college dorm, these fancy chefs, right? Uh, and she would like to help. So, okay, I'm kinda, what does she know that these people don't know? My high school experience began in a boarding school in Connecticut, a world away from my home in Beijing. My main concern besides academics was dinner. Back home, I loved eating as a communal and comforting experience, but there was nothing comforting about the tasteless steamed vegetables and lukewarm chicken at my new dining hall. The students just stuffed their faces, voiced displeasure with the food and left. Besides the cafeteria, there was an expensive and unappetizing Chinese food express. All my friends ordered from the Chinese restaurant, I realized the dorm was equipped with a microwave. I researched recipes and became a big success by making noodle soup, chicken wings, and garlic seafood. Admittedly, finding the right time and power setting the properly cooked fish took a few unsuccessful tries. Not only did these meals satisfy my stomach, but my wallet was happy too. The smell of garlic seafood caused a flood of students and before long, Cindy specials were hit for dinner. Friends bonded over the food and would have great discussions. So we set up this scene where the student, you know, is first empathizing or even uh, sympathizing with these uh, fancy chefs who are trying to operate in a college dorm. And she has this experience cooking in a dorm. But what really brought her to begin cooking, and we're not done with the essay just yet. There's a second page. Uh, what brought her to begin cooking first was uh, missing home, which is fine. Two, recognizing that there was a problem at her school, right? People were unhappy with the food and realizing maybe there was something she could do. She could bring a little bit of home to the school and we're, and then it builds up so that suddenly uh, she's built a whole network of people who are excited for this food. She's built community around cooking. So it's more than just a hobby. It's really kind of nourishing people and making people happy. And this is kind of how she's approached uh, what otherwise you could say is a very banal mundane thing make some food who cares but this is quite important for her and let's continue reading on over time i began to wonder just how much fun cooking would be could be with proper accessories actual burners in an oven so during a spring break i went to the culinary institute of america for a first-hand learning experience didn't take long to realize i had more familiarity with the kitchen than my teammates bonnie could barely boil water and cook noodles without causing a fire tim was too scared to handle a knife for fear of cutting his fingers my initial instinct was to get them out of the way, but the teachers insisted on group participation. I say this is well done. I, I, I say it's well done, we can say, well, I, we think it's good. Why? Because she's made a transition into how she's deepened her interest and she has a bit of self-awareness in that her initial instinct was to, that these people are bad, I don't wanna deal with them. But then she said, well, my teachers, you know, told me that we insist on group participation. So she doesn't just end it with they're bad and then luckily, luckily I came in and fixed it. No, they said, well, I realized I shouldn't have that initial instinct. You know, I was maybe uh, not the right way, but my teachers, uh, you know, insist on group participation. So, okay, so then what should she do? That means she needs to help people, not just take over. I pulled Tim aside and demonstrated a safe method of slicing pasta for different types of noodles. I showed Bonnie how to stir noodles in boiling water and the value of timing. By the end of my time at the Culinary Institute, my team had won a school competition with our banana style noodle with salad. Put Tim in charge of creating the pasta while Bonnie was directed to slice the mushrooms and carrots for the salad. I was most proud when Tim and Bonnie received high praise from the teachers for their completed tasks. We celebrated over generous portions of the delicious pasta. To this day, we share stories of recipes and friendship. After the success at the Culinary Institute, I wanted to bring more cooking to my daily routine. I can't go to the supermarket frequently, so I find myself using whatever I have to make new recipes. 
This has led to some rather unusual dinners, such as a spam ramen burger. It might sound unusual, but it's now a regular menu item for me and my friends. Frying up a thick slab of soy sauce slathered spam is simple enough, but bringing the ramen noodle bun, but preparing the ramen noodle bun takes practice. I first cooked a dry brick of instant ramen in boiling water until it's perfectly al dente. The noodles are then coated with a lightly bean egg, pressed into two separate bun shapes, and carefully browned in a pan so the eggs cook and the noodles bind together. So she's really uh, gone pretty deep into this recipe, but is anybody else hungry? I'm a little hungry. So I'm getting that kind of feeling, ooh, that does sound pretty good. I can see what she's doing there, what she's using, and I kind of want some of that. Then boom, seeing the satisfaction on my friend's faces from this burger makes me very happy. I'm always thinking that not a cook of food, but also a cook of life. Cooking is creative and food is a gathering point, strengthening community. I am looking forward to creating a college community and sharing meals with my dorm mates. So the idea is you read this and I gotta admit, I think this student is pretty nice. I think this student is gonna, you know what she's gonna be like when she hits the dorms. You know, you know she's gonna make the lives of others better. And this is the kind of stuff, isn't this a student that colleges want? And she did not win any incredible awards here. This is not a student who was number one in their class. She ended up going to UC San Diego with a SAT score significantly below their average score. Uh, but we shouldn't be so surprised. She's a great student and she has great qualities and they were, had to be, they were exhibited in her essays. So we just use this as one example. We're gonna keep going on to other uh, essay types. But once again, uh, there was nothing here to speak to her academics or her future major that's not required. And you'll see that oftentimes those topics are covered by the supplements. So it's not to say those things are not important. It's just every single piece of the puzzle connecting together in a proper way. Why our school, this is one of the major supplement types. Most schools want to know, why do you want to apply to our school? Uh, the idea is you wanna make these as personal as possible. If you visited, great. If you don't have the opportunity to visit, do a virtual information session. Get in touch with somebody at the school. You have to show some personal connection to the school. It's very, very helpful. Otherwise, you're just parroting things off the website. It's not great. Of course, still do your research. Uh, there's a lot to learn about schools. There's a lot in their mission. There's a lot in how they structure their academic programs. It's all schools do. So they care about it and they want you to care about it. The goal of the essay should be that you prove you truly know the school, that you actually want to, and you actually like, truly want to go to this school. I, I put the actually in the this in italics, with too many italics, it's a bit overwhelming. But the point is that you truly want to go in that specifically this school, not just to any college. So we're gonna go into an example of what can make a good YR school essay. Okay, so this is a student got in Northwestern, uh, top 10 school in the Chicago area. And you'll see from their prompt, other parts, other parts of your application give us a sense uh, for how you might contribute to Northwestern, but we also want to consider how Northwestern will contribute to your interests and goals. In 300 words or less, please help us understand what aspects of Northwestern appeal most to you and how you'll make use of specific resources and opportunities here. So wh why do we need you? What are you gonna bring to us? How are you gonna leverage what we have? They didn't say specifically why Northwestern. They made it a little bit uh, more nuanced. And you wanna, you wanna make sure to address these points very, very clearly. So this student is going for BME, very strong student. Uh, what appeals most to me about Northwestern is that it houses some of the world's top scholars and innovators in Evanston who are accessible and willing to work with undergraduates on research projects. Once again, this is just 300 words. You gotta get right down to the point. This is not a time to tell about your life story. But you do need to give details about why uh, you, you want this thing and perhaps some information about your past. So after my summer 2019 internship at Rutgers University Materials Science and Engineering Department, where I designed and implemented a procedure to test the effect of varying gecko toe pad surface chemistry on the effectiveness of the self-cleaning of its feet, I am seeking a school that is committed to undergraduate research. Okay, so this is why research matters. I've done it and I want to do more of it. Okay, keep going. I know I will be fully supported at Northwestern, the Office of Undergraduate Research, and its available resources such as the academic year and summer undergraduate research grants. When I visited Evanston, I was struck by Northwestern's proximity to Chicago and its connections to Chicago-based businesses. As a future biomedical engineering BME student interested in research opportunities, I 
felt I like that McCormick School works collaboratively with peers at area hospitals in the Feinberg School of Medicine, and that I could work towards an MS degree in BME even as an undergraduate. So you have a lot of research into the school that uh, Northwestern not only does research uh, on undergraduate level, but also there are career, there's a linkage to career interests and just the fact that a student learned a lot of this while on a trip there. The McCormick School of Engineering's emphasis on producing a whole brain engineer in the engineers yields versatile and prepared engineers, <clears throat> particularly appeals to me since I've consistently pursued and enjoy right-brained activities such as art and piano along with my math and science pursuits. One of the goals I have for my undergraduate engineering education is to develop skills such as collaboration and leadership <coughs> that complement the knowledge I obtain through a classroom environment. And McCormick's whole brain engineering will enable me to do that. McCormick's engineering first curriculum provides an innovative foundation my freshman year education focused on hands-on work and well-rounded thinking. It is exciting to know that I have opportunities in undergraduate research during my first year and can engineer early with real engineers, in quotes. The BME program in particular has a staggering 70% of undergraduates, undergraduate students who engage in research. I hope to be able to be one of those students and enhance my potential as a future engineer by utilizing all the resources that Northwestern offers. So we have a really impassioned plea for why Northwestern? And I'm going to be clearly using a lot of these resources. So if the school spends so much time into putting these resources together, well, luckily, I'm going to be using them. And you can see where I'm going to go with this because you know I've done in the past. You can see from my research that I'm very prepared to join the proper programs. And you get the sense that this student will absolutely uh, pursue uh, the opportunities that exist at Northwestern. In addition, to really believes in the mission of the school when they talk about the whole brain engineer, the idea that it can't just be math science, that you have to have this element of humanities as well. So I would say this was you know, a well done essay in that it addresses the prompt, shows background to the student, shows the research. Anybody who reads this clearly knows the student wants to go to not just Northwestern, but even studying at the McCormick School in the area of BME. All right. Let's keep going. Another very popular one is your impact on community. So this is something a lot of schools ask. Uh, they wanna know what constitutes your community? Do you consider others? Uh, do you leverage skills, passion to help others? And I'm going back to the italics, so bear with me. Prove you truly know you actually wanna to go to this school. You need to be showing in your impact uh, that you really care about this group of people and that you are going to actually be making the impact you say that you're interested in. So we're gonna look right at the essay. This one actually is from Berkeley. I know we said the UCs were last week, well, they're this week too, because they asked the same question about community. So we don't need to look at a non-UC prompt. Uh, but we'll look at the prompt itself. What have you done to make your school or community a better place? Uh, the UCs ask this quite directly. And um, this was a student at Vanda Berkeley, very happy. So, I can never forget the time when I was playing the piano for the elders at Sunrise Senior Living, where I volunteer on weekends. A visiting relative came up to me and once our eyes locked, said, thank you for doing this. I can still see that moment in my mind, the well-lit spacious common room, the tall dark haired young man, dressed in a dark jacket, walking up to the piano and bending down to thank me. It was so memorable because I had never considered such a reaction. I did not think what I was doing, merely playing music, could have such an impact and such an impact people that impact that people would come forward and thank me for it. Sunrise is an assisted living home near my neighborhood. And most of the seniors there have Alzheimer's. They're either wheelchair bound or rely on walkers. They do not speak much and their hearing abilities are hindered too. Communication is not easy with them. I repeat sentences multiple times to be understood. Yet when I am playing music for them, everything just flows. When I start playing, the seniors in the room soon multiply the wheelchairs are all, all arranged to face the piano and they just listen quietly. It often reminded me of the times I practiced the piano and my grandmother came to listen. Once when I finished the song, an elderly man in old fashioned glasses and hat rolled his wheelchair up to me and excitedly talked for 20 minutes about his piano records, how he loves piano music, how amazing he thinks the piano is. He reminds me so much of my own grandfather who also loved music. All I could do was just listen and smile. The, those moments of gratitude make me realize that it is worth it, that I am doing something, and that what I'm doing is making an impact on these seniors, facilitating communication through the shared unspoken language of music. Now, we'll roll it back. This activity is also very normal. 
to be performing or doing some work with elderly people is quite normal. A lot of students do it, but we get a sense that this is more than an activity for the student. They've connected it to a skill that they enjoy playing the piano. They connect, she, she connected her impact that she's made on the people that she performs for to her own family. Uh, this reminds her of her own family members. Uh, and then we go, and she goes very deep into certain key moments of kind of appreciation or responses, talking about this impact and recognizing that this pursuit, although once again, there's no major uh, awards here, there's no major accomplishment here, but she values this impact. And for her to be able to use the power of music to connect with these elderly people who otherwise maybe it's hard to talk to them or you know they're having uh, different issues, if she can make that kind of impact, then, oh, then it's good that she goes there weekly. And it's really something that is valued in the community and that she's excited to be a part of. So it comes from a, a strong sincerity uh, and commitment that we have what we would say is a commitment and we would say it have impact in this case. Uh, but let us continue to other types of supplements that you can expect to have to answer. Uh, this is a very common one, favorite activity, academic interest. So you have the common app activity section. Uh, you have the opportunity to write about 10 different activities, but you have a 150 character limit. It's pretty short. You can't say much about the activities. So in this essay, they ask you to expand on an activity, generally that you mentioned in your activities list in Common App. So you often want to highlight either things like leadership, teamwork, passion, something that was not evident through the activities section. What this thing really means for you? Why do you really care to do it? So let's hop into one that may illustrate it well. <clears throat> so this is a student, a girl who ends up at Vanderbilt. Uh, she's a good, good student. Uh, once again, let's see how she approached this. Please briefly elaborate on one of your extracurricular activities or work experiences. So, we call ourselves the book club, though we are the varsity girls tennis team. We're named after the scrapbook passed down every year, each generation adding pictures, quotes, and inside jokes. This was the first competitive team I participated in. Beforehand, I entered tennis tournaments but as an independent singles player. Joining the team taught me to be unselfish. In order to establish a ladder, we competed against each other, fueling resentment between players. However, once the ladder was established, <clears throat> everybody had to let go of past tensions and work together. Only when I became unselfish, abandoning my singles mindset, did I become a valuable team member. I saw in our improvement how hardworking cooperation led to incredible results. Our experience as a team transformed us, and for that reason, we keep a lasting community and pass down a book from generation to generation. Now, let's consider this. This student was not recruited for tennis. She was not a top player in the nation, but she did it, it was very social for her. She really enjoyed it. And if you just see this written in the activity section, it looks like every other student. Girls tennis, varsity letter winner, decent player, right? Nothing special. But for her, it was special. Uh, for her to have this community of uh, team members and for her to kind of grow personally, she, you know, this was an activity that did need more explaining. And there's no space to put these types of words in the activity section. So we always wanna think, is there an aspect of an activity that can't be known through just quantifying it or describing it briefly that a school should know about? So in this case, if we can relate this sort of activity to personal growth and recognizing her as this, you know, starting off with, uh, the, you know, that we call ourselves the book club. We can get a sense this is a warm community. These girls are really close friends. There's a lot of camaraderie. And then she balances it with that it actually didn't happen right away, right? This wasn't normal for her, but she built it over time. And that is, uh, that's pretty special. So in that way, you know, we'd say that this shows a nice aspect of her character that is otherwise uh, unknown through the application. So this is a nice balance. All right. So we covered a lot of good topics, and then some schools are gonna give you what we call a quirky topic. A uh, quirky topic means it could be anything. Uh, we're gonna go into which school usually does this. The, the hint is University of Chicago. They usually do this. They really like quirky topics, fun topics. Uh, so that means this essay, because the topic is non-traditional, the essay should be fun, creative, risk-taking, all about your personality, all about your voice. Uh, you gotta really you know, bring the energy 
and, and your personal voice to the essay. Let's look at an example. So this was from University of Chicago, a very strong student. And the topic of, that they had that year, they changed them. University of Chicago changes pretty much every year, most of them. But they said, art is either plagiarism or revolution. This is a quote from Paul Gauguin, a painter. What is your art? Is it plagiarism or revolution? So we start off with just, you know, we're gonna throw any convention out. Boom, boom, boom. Dozens of explosions detonated one after the other. A chalky red flyer flooded into the house, destroying everything in its path. The inferno quickly spread into my room, devouring large chests full of valuable diamonds and gold I jolted out of my bed. Digging through one of my unscathed trunks, I managed to retrieve a steel bucket I filled the bucket with water and vigorously splashed it onto my surroundings, neutralizing the flames and forging an exit path. Once I got out, I realized from the unnaturally illuminated pitch black sky that my house wasn't the only house on fire. The entire town was on fire. Boom. A block of TNT detonated right next to me. My health drastically dropped. Frantically reaching into my bag, I pulled out a red vial. I desperately chugged down the poison. My health bars slowly regained their form, turning around, I assessed the damage done. The city was unrecognizable. So what, what, what's, what's just happened? All right? It seems like we're in a fantasy world. It seems we're in some kind of game scenario, but it's exciting. There are things happening, clearly. It's not going how he planned, though. Darn it, I wheezed with tears in my eyes. It was the fifth time this month that this happened. I pressed the escape key on my computer and was greeted by Minecraft's log. I was going, oh, we're playing Minecraft. Always build a world. What's going on here? Closing my laptop, I lied on my bed thinking about how I had to recreate my archaeology project all over again. I was just a fan trying to pay homage to Tolkien. All I wanted to do was to create an artistic replica of Middle Earth from the blocks in the game. As a child, I had excessively read and reread the Lord of the Rings series. Tolkien introduced to me a whole new world of imagination and wonder. Why couldn't the players destroying my buildings appreciate Middle Earth's magic as I had? So we get that he's working on a project. This is his form of creativity. This is his art. He's not a typical artist, but to build these worlds uh, is what he's into, you know. And uh, Chicago is known to be, you know, more on the nerdy side. It's okay to have, like, these kind of geeky things, but done in a professional way, in a serious way. It's not just playing video games. He turned playing video games into something bigger. Uh, let's continue. The environment shouldn't be this hostile. Minecraft should be a medium where artists can freely express themselves just as players play the game. The game is practically a virtual manifestation of Legoland. Everything in Minecraft is made out of building blocks. These endless opportunities to create should be taken advantage of. I wasn't mad or anything, just disappointed. I collected resources to make tools, and I used these tools to collect resources. In short, I mined to craft and crafted to mine. Theoretically, the number of blocks I could obtain from the game is infinite. Unfortunately, however, with five AP classes, two varsity sports, 10 internships, seven instruments, and three incomplete personal statements on my plate, my time was limited. I had to go through extremely long lengths to plan out what I need, figuring out which blocks were essential to crafting Middle Earth, but I wasted my time again. So we get this sense that, you know, he put a lot of time into this craft, really cares, and, and for him to be upset and kind of disappointed and sad that it's not working out, uh, it shows a lot of sincerity. We kind of have this sympathy. It's kind of a silly thing, but we do want it to work out for him. We get that what he wants is this good thing. He celebrates the creativity, celebrates the endless possibilities, and really all he bemoans is that he doesn't have enough time to do it because he's so swamped with trying to be an achiever in high school. And obviously, he's not truly doing 10 instruments. He's not truly doing seven instruments, sorry, uh, 10 internships and seven instruments. You know, but as a high school student, you're expected to be you know, this kind of superhuman, right? Uh, so he's doing his best. Let's continue reading. The griefers, or the destructive players, on the other hand, only had to figure out one thing, when to strike. They found pleasure in causing destruction and pain. Fueled off of Doritos and Mountain Dew, the, the fedora-wearing griefers were the bane of my existence. I was tired of submitting to the tyranny of the griefers. I had to figure out how to beat them myself. It was time for a revolution. So is this art plagiarism revolution? We're a revolution. Okay, keep going. I hit the library and started borrowing books about economics. Minecraft, after all, was a game of scarcity and returns. The blocks were infinite, but the time to mine them all gave diminishing returns. I had to learn how to maximize efficiency and how to sustain my project despite the griefers' effort to derail me. I began to compile Excel spreadsheets about the game. I listed how long it took to mine certain blocks, and I kept an inventory of the resources that I had acquired. 
I invested in precious ore blocks and dumped other inefficient resource blocks. I graphed charts to figure out the most efficient tools to use and when to use them. I stalked my griefers, recording the time periods in which they were online. I analyzed my data and looked for trends. I worked on creating Middle Earth while the griefers were offline, while the server was off peaks of online traffic. My revolution was swinging into full action. Soon enough, I began to obtain my blocks faster than the griefers could destroy them. I didn't have to work any harder. I was working smarter. My optimized work ethic outpaced their disruptive frenzy. Even with the smog's help, the griefers couldn't stop me. My model of Middle Earth no longer consisted of post-TNT griefer craters and hobbit holes. The art model boasted of fortresses, chambers, castles, and temples. Through efficiency and hard work, I was able to complete my project without a griefer even attempting to blow up my art anymore. I won the revolution, demonstrating to the Minecraft community how circumstances shouldn't just be accepted. They should be challenged. And with that, I challenged other newer griefers to destroy my buildings again with a sign outside which read, you shall not pass. So once again, you know, you Chicago right here, they're letting you run with it. What's your art? Is it revolution? Is it plagiarism? Say whatever you want. Just make something that, you know, I can resonate with that I think makes you interesting. And that shows that you have a depth for thought. Once again, uh, you know, A, having the passion to do this, B, running into problems and then going into doing some independent research to, to improve them, documenting your work, to have this kind of uh, logical and more scientific method for improving how you're building the, the Minecraft world. I mean, this is all pretty serious stuff. It's, it's boxed into a fun kind of boisterous attitude about approaching it, but it's actually, it's quite serious stuff. So it covers what you want by being you know, really highly creative, a lot of personal voice, speaking to something you truly care about, while also having uh, showing a depth of thought that it's not just all chaos and you know it's not just loud. Uh, there's something going on there that's a bit deeper and that anybody can respect, oh, this is probably a very legitimate student. It's probably quite smart. This has this passion, right, uh, for building Minecraft worlds. That's fine. Uh, so, you know, there are many different types of essays, uh, but one to break down some of the key ones, I'm trying to go a little quickly uh, as not to, uh, you know, go on too, too long. But we want to review uh, the idea being as you approach your essays, you want to be comprehensive, but cohesive. So you got to consider that strategy. Consider how much essays, how each essay works with the others. If they all work well together, they create that beautiful picture that you're trying to create. Show your humanity. What do you really care about? It's, essays are not the time to strictly talk about your achievements and accomplishments unless that's what the prompt asks for. Uh, be impact driven. Everybody's going to, once again, remember how you made them feel. And if you were able to make someone in a story feel something that can really resonate with people. Uh, hi highlight yourself. Don't brag. Make sure to have some kind of self-awareness. There's no way you didn't do anything wrong. If you did something wrong, celebrate it. How did you get better? Celebrate the way in which you overcame the issues. If you ignore them, somebody just knows you're just ignoring the issues. It's not because you're perfect. That's not possible. We just know you're ignoring the issues. Maybe because you're too self-conscious. Maybe because you never fixed the issues. Uh, make sure to be self-aware and, and, and celebrate them with showing that you overcame them through some kind of critical thinking or new solution. <clears throat> Always be aware that how you express something beats what you did, and that what you did is probably very, it could be deemed very minor, right? Joining a girls varsity uh, tennis team, doing some cooking for some friends, building a Minecraft world, that's all, that's the what. None of that stuff is particularly impressive, but framed in the essay, giving background, speaking to the impact, suddenly those are really exciting things. I like those students a lot now. And show you're nice. Don't forget, uh, college admissions officers want nice people on campus. Just like if you were applying for a job, you come in for an interview, people say, oh, does this person have a good attitude? Do they fit our culture? Uh, you know, are they nice, right? So after each application, you know, let's say admissions officer, think of it this way. Uh, do I want to have lunch with you? Do I want to get to know you better? Do I like you? And will I accept you to join my campus? These are all really critical questions. And if you go through essays and you don't have that answer, it's a problem. And you maybe didn't approach them properly. So in order to help students, we have full application support. That means all aspects of application. We do have uh, essay only, essay specific services as well. We have mentor service for younger students to cover extracurricular planning, academic planning as we build their uh, career futures. 
we have package services. You know, most of our students do that, just multi-year multi plan. Uh, so please, please contact us with any questions you have. We do hope to be always working with more and more students. Of course, we're very proud of our results. We have students all over the country at top universities, and uh, everybody's going uh, top 100. Of course, most students uh, are looking at even higher than that. And we always believe we just help students reach their potential. So if they get into Ivy League school or some kind of school like that, well, that's what they really deserve in the first place. Uh, we just make sure that you know they're developing in the proper way.